This is an iPhone 6 Plus that has come back in after being repaired for touch disease. And you can see here that what I did is just went ahead and assembled all the parts that we needed to get it to turn on outside of the housing because I don't want to take this back and forth in and out. So um, what I'm going to do here is have my lightning port down at the bottom and I will use that in order to prompt a boot on this thing. So once we plug that in, as long as we have the battery connected, we can disconnect it at that point. And you can also short the pins on the connector for the power button if you want to, either way works. But I wanted to make sure that I could get this all on camera while I was testing it out. So rather than recording that part under the microscope, I have it here so that you can see. So we'll give it a second here to boot up. So now you see that there are areas that do function properly up at the top down at the bottom in the middle, but just below the middle, I'd say about a third of the way up, there's a there's an area that just doesn't respond. I'm trying to kind of point out where it is right now. You'll see that my where it looks like my finger is just kind of slipping instead of moving the screen. Oh, didn't mean to go that far. Let's see if we can. Go back a bit here. So you see where it doesn't scroll. It'll kind of lag right there where it says said Netherlands. You see it drags down and then just kind of skips over a very small area. And of course, that's not going to work out because we need the whole screen to work. But on top of that, getting past the activation screen when there's no SIM card inside appears to be a problem also. So that's the area that we're looking at right there. So I was wondering, you know, why would everything else on this display work? There are no gray bars. It's just that one dead area. And I've tried multiple screens and had the same results. So obviously there's, you know, more than likely it's got to have something to do with the repair that was done on the Touch IC. And rather than just replacing it, because I hate when you do these things two or three times in a row and that wasn't the problem to start with, I wanted to do a, a slightly uh, deeper diagnosis here and try to figure out why it is that this one little part on the screen doesn't want to respond properly. So I'll go ahead and take this off and get a look at it into the microscope and then try to figure out if we can track down the problem. So what I noticed on the inside is that this particular pin on the digitizer connector had OL when it should have instead had a low resistance to ground. So there was something obviously that wasn't connected and what I did from here is I just kind of clicked on this inside of the board view schematic and then tried to figure out where exactly the, it went to. So if we look at the other side under the Mason chip, we can see that that goes to J6. And because there are a whole bunch of these with very similar names, I'm just going to assume that that means that they go to different areas on the touch screen, which would make sense if we have one area that doesn't work. So taking a look at the schematic here, we can see where these are for the connector and for the Mason chip itself. All right. so since this has been removed before, it's going to come off a little easier than usual. What you'll probably notice here is that the coil over there on the side has a big crack in the top of it. But my understanding is that that's not a big deal and it shouldn't affect the, affect the touch functionality. You can also see up there in the top right hand corner where I ran my jumper. But uh, since this has been removed before, it is going to come off uh, slightly easier, I believe. However, I should add that i I suspect at this point that the problem may have had to do with the fact that this chip already had the balls underneath installed on it and instead of removing and replacing them I just installed it as is. I didn't have my solder paste with me at the time and I assumed it would work okay. So it's going to be difficult to tell just by looking underneath here but I suspect that that J6 connector was not making contact and you know if anyone has any other ideas by all means Feel free to chime in or leave a comment, but that's what I suspect at this point. So in any case, I went ahead and took this off and used the same chip again, but instead of, obviously at this point it's got to be cleaned up, so I'm going to go ahead and clean around this area here on the board, and then I'm going to go ahead and put new balls on the bottom of the chip so that they're all nice and even. Alright, so let's get some flux inside here and go ahead and retin these pads. Just want to go over them and make sure everything's nice and even for the most part. And this is probably the one place where I would say that you'll see the biggest difference between 
a very inexpensive soldering station and something that maintains a constant temperature and that's when you go to tin the pads on the board because it's so easy to get these things too hot to where they float off or if you don't have enough heat or you've got fluctuations in your temperature and your iron drops down you might get to the point where it melts and then it cools off and it sticks to the pad and that's when you start pulling the pads off so there's really a lot that can go wrong here and you've got to have consistent temperatures and know your soldering equipment to make it work. Alright, so once we think those look pretty good, I'm just going to get some isopropyl alcohol here on the end of a swab and very carefully go and try to clean this up so we can get a better look at it. Now, you'll notice there's at least one ball on there that has a tiny bit of solder sticking up. And that's why I say you want to be very careful because what can happen is you can actually snag the end of your swab if you've got anything rough on those pads right now, which we really shouldn't. Uh, and here's a closer look at my jumper there. Uh, but if you've got something sticking up there, it looks kind of like a Hershey's Kiss, you know, just a pointed tip at the top of one of those pads. If you get too aggressive here while you're cleaning this up, you can snag those and pull them right off the board. So that's another thing you really have to watch out for here. And the one that's on there, it's not tall enough to cause a problem when we go to install the chip. I think you can kind of get a better look at it there. Um, that's going to work for the most part, but you really want to try to avoid having too many of those. And obviously, if you have any big clumps on there, we want to make sure that we even them out. That's the main thing is that making sure that we have a consistent size and uh, level on all of these balls. All right, so now what we're going to do is just quickly clean off the bottom side of the chip. I want to just, again, have a nice even surface to work with so that when I put the new balls on top of here, they come out to a consistent size. Because if not, then we'll have a problem, I assume, similar to what we did with this phone in the first place, and that was that something lost contact. I, I really strongly suspect that that's what the problem was. So we take a look at this kind of from an angle, and you can see that those are pretty flat. And now is usually my favorite part, and that is when we want to go ahead and get the stencil lined up, um, which after that, for me, it's pretty much downhill. But getting this thing just to be perfectly lined up, that's kind of the tricky part, especially when you have some tape underneath it. So what I do is kind of clean off the backside of the chip, get some captain tape underneath it, set it down so that will stabilize it. And then, uh, as you can see, I'm under the microscope, and I wanted to give you kind of my view from here while we align this thing and set it into place and once we do the tape will hold it onto the stencil so that it doesn't shift around while we're working with it so i'm going to give this uh, another wipe down real quick with some rubbing alcohol this thing has little bits of flux and old solder on it old solder paste to make sure we have a nice clean area to work with and that all those holes are open and then if we get lucky and i did happen to get lucky this time and i aligned it straight on the first try that doesn't always happen so if not then just try again of course uh, but that one went on straight, so all we have to do is make sure we have the tape stuck down. And you may want to add a bit of flux inside of the holes here. I didn't find that to be necessary in this case, and most of the time the solder paste is going to have a certain amount of flux inside of it. But if you end up with problems where the chip gets stuck to your stencil after you heat it up, then you may want to add some flux you know, right inside there before you do that. All right, so it's time to reball this chip. This is the way I like to do it. I have worked with the the small little solder balls that go into these grids, but for the most part, I find that the mechanic solder paste works the best for me. And I will put links to all of the equipment that I use during this repair down in the video description in case you're interested in checking them out. So we've got this all filled in pretty well. Make sure we've got paste in every single one of those holes and then I'll just kind of wipe away the excess stuff. Although you will notice on this one, it did pick up a bit of the material that was outside of the grid there. Uh, but fortunately that did not end up being a problem. So just come in here with some heat, slow and easy. And I gotta say, I just, I love the way these things work. Um, you can use the pre-made balls, but the paste for me has been uh, pretty much the easiest to work with. All right, so I'm going to zoom out here, flip this thing over, and hope that it's not going to stick to the stencil. On occasion, that's the thing. But usually, if you just wipe it down with some isopropyl rubbing alcohol, 
as long as you had a bit of flux in there to start with, they usually aren't too bad. You can see I've got my captain there. I'm just going to peel that off. And I don't want to actually physically pull the chip from the back. If it doesn't just fall off on its own, I'll usually take a small poker and just push on the other side to get it to come off. And I'll wipe that with some alcohol in the back also. And make sure that none of the balls are bigger than the holes, because if so, obviously that's going to be a problem. But they should fit through there if you just give them a very gentle amount of pressure. And that's ready to come off. And I am going to speed this up just a bit so you don't have to sit through the boring part. And let's get this thing cleaned up and hopefully get a decent look at it. So my plan was to set this thing on its side so you can see how uniform these are. And you'll get a very short, brief look at it, but uh, you'll have to take my word. They, end, they did end up becoming um, level for the most part. It's hard to get a hold of these things without putting pressure on them. So I always struggle with getting these to go up on their side. Try to get underneath it here a bit. If you take a look there, you can see they're, they're pretty uniform right there and then it fell off at the tweezers all right so this area has been cleaned up we've already tinned it you can see my jumper up there at the top right hand corner and i'm going to get the board just warmed up a bit before i put some flux on here And make sure we've got this facing the right direction. You can see the little dot up there uh, on the lower right hand corner. That is the correct orientation. And I'm going to set this as close to where it's supposed to be as I can. And this is where having a steadier hand would go a long way. Okay, so that looks pretty close. And I usually if you take a look down from the side, I know this is out of the camera's view right now, but if you can take a look in there, you can usually see where those balls are aligned underneath from the edge, and that'll give you a pretty good idea as to whether you've got it centered or not. And then of course what we want to do is come in with enough heat to get this thing to melt in a short period of time, but not with so much airflow that we blow anything off, uh, including the IC itself. So. This is one of those things that just takes a bit of practice. But fortunately, this one cooperated. So we'll just come in here and heat this until it kind of makes this, the flux flow out so that it sinks down a bit. And again, you don't really want it to shift, of course, but it should kind of pull itself into position as long as you've got the balls making contact. The surface tension should kind of straighten them out. You'll see I knock it off just a hair right here, so I'm just going to push it over a bit and that kind of aligned it, gave it a little extra heat and now we'll cool it down and take a look from the sides. And once again, it's, it's difficult to see under the scope here, but if you get just the right angle, you can usually kind of see that the balls are aligned and making contact underneath the chip. Yeah, it's hard to get the angle right for the camera here, but in any case, I went ahead and cleaned that up and now the moment of truth, we'll plug it in again and hope that this solved our problem. Right, so plug it in. And there we have a nice, smooth, fully functional touchscreen. I'll put the board into the ultrasonic cleaner, get it nice and dried out, reassemble the phone, and we are good to go. 
If you found the video helpful, like it, share it, check out my channel for more tutorials and product reviews, and most of all, remember to hit the subscribe button. Feel free to leave your feedback in the comments section, and thanks for watching.